This week's One Piece anime episode had some pretty good work in it, I felt like. Go, Goku, go! I mean, it was pretty flashy at points, but I thought overall it was alright. Part of the reason for why I said that the Zoro moment looked good last week was because, at least when it comes to Zoro, the auras kind of make sense, because he has the whole demon Ashura cursed sword thing about him. But with Luffy versus Kaido, it's a little bit different. By the way, the shot of Kaido here reminds me a lot of Frieza. It looks like he's like, you know, doing a Frieza face, getting cut in half or something. I took these screenshots of Luffy during the episode as well, and I don't know if they're trying to foreshadow the Nika Nika no Mi awakening, but it just looks like it's a completely different art style. Like in this shot, he even looks identical to Deku. I'm not even kidding, this is actually in the episode. Anyway, the actual chapter starts off with a cover that shows Katakuri using his awakening, an oven about to attack the Vinsmoke siblings. It's been a while since we've gotten a Vinsmoke cover page, but if you remember, last time we got one, the Vinsmokes, or at least Reiju, appeared to be running into Caesar. So where did Caesar go? It's interesting. Uh, is he going to come in and try and help the Vinsmokes by removing the oxygen or something? Well, Katakuri has future sight, so I'm not sure how well that would work, but, you know. I remember that during the tea party, Katakuri was able to deal with Ichiji very easily, very efficiently. But in this case, it's a four on two, and if Caesar gets involved, it'll be a five on two, so I guess we'll see what happens. I still think that at least two members of the Blackbeard Pirates are in Hokkaik Island currently as well. I think that this fight is actually going to be a distraction that they could use to their advantage to steal a copy of the Road Poneglyph and then just get out of there. And that would actually kind of coincide with what's going on with Kid and Law, you know, them getting copies of these things so that they can be on their way. The actual chapter starts and we see Raizo and Shinobu suffering the consequences of Green Bull's leech seed technique. I thought this week's chapter was super shocking. I did not expect what happened by the end. Like, it, it just baffled me. It was just so intriguing. I mean, who would have thought that would actually die? I mean, I don't even read My Hero Academia, and even I learned about what happened. So once again, Oda decides to dedicate some serious panel time to the scabbards here. I will say, though, that I did find Raizo's appearance to be actually funny. And I also like how there's that huge undertone of, like, Kinemon just you know, spending the night with his wife, going crazy after 20 years. The word I'm searching for... I can't say, because there's preschool toys present. Like, both Kinemon and Otsuru have that pretty distinct afterglow. Now, the actual essence of this chapter is a way for Oda to tease us about who is actually going to end up joining the crew. Is it Carrot, or is it Yamato? So first, Carrot is summoned by Nekomamushi and Inorashi, and I find it interesting that she's eating Odin. So there's a pretty obvious connection there, you know, Carrot eating Odin, and then Yamato by the end saying that it's time to finally live a life like Odin. Now I find the logic behind making Carrot the ruler of Zo kind of faulty, because for one, like the reason Nekomamushi and Inorashi say that they want to stay in Wano is to protect Lord Momonosuke. Except that if you actually go back and read the last chapter, you'll see that both Nekomamushi and Inorashi were there trying to fight against Green Bull, and at least from what I could tell, they really couldn't do much of anything. I mean, granted, they weren't using their Sulong form, and even if we take it back to Odin, the Scabbards were never really good at protecting Odin anyway, but then they want to go ahead and leave Carrot in charge, because she went to Whole Cake Island to have some cake, and had a brief transformation scene. So I really appreciate Carrot's sense of self-awareness because she calls them out. She's like, no, what are you, are you crazy? Like, I got the shit kicked out of me by Pedos Pedo. Nekomamushi was the one who actually had to step in to take care of him. So not only is Carrot being offered a position that she's not super qualified for, but then also the cat and the dog want to stay behind to do a job that they themselves are not super qualified to do either. And then Wanda tries to make this whole thing to be about Pedro's will, when Pedro's will was essentially that he wanted to help Roger issue in the new Dawn. We definitely need to see Carrot next chapter, because if she decides to stay behind, we need to get an explanation as to why it is that her staying behind in Zo is actually the right thing to do in regards to fulfilling Pedro's will. Apparently, Sukuyaki decides to break his own rule and tell Momonosuke and Hiyori that he is, in fact, their grandfather. Because if you remember, back in chapter 1053, Sukuyaki says this to Robin. He says, My name is Kozuki Sukuyaki, the father of Kozuki Odin. And Robin says, Does Momo know? And then Sukuyaki says, No. 
and I have no intention of telling him. But I guess his feelings of wanting to spend time with his grandchildren overpowered him. And so, yeah, we get a scene with Hiyori and Momonosuke embracing him. And just like Sukiyaki suspected, most of the scabbards had already kind of figured his identity out, except for Kinemon. And so we get a repetition of that gag that we got at the beginning of the raid where he's supposed to be a genius in terms of figuring stuff out. But the truth is, is he's totally clueless. I feel like that gag for Kinemon, though, is something that is relatively new to his character. Like, it kind of gives me the impression that Oda always wanted Kinemon to have a gag, but he really couldn't figure out which gag to give him. I guess he was just trying to figure out a way to make him funnier or more likable. And so by the time he actually settled on a gag for him, it was already kind of too late because it was the beginning of Act 3. We get a scene with the Straw Hats interacting that serves two purposes. The first one is to essentially like let Caribou know about Pluton. And so now he has intel on two out of the three ancient weapons. And so I'm guessing that if he's going to tag along, whichever island is next, if Caribou is there, then whatever island we go to next is where we'll find information on Uranus. And then the second narrative purpose that this scene serves is to have Luffy reiterate Ace's promise to Tama, which is that he will eventually take her out to sea when she becomes an actual Kunoichi. Now, thanks to Green Bull's liposuction, it turns out that Shinobu has gone back to looking like she was when she was younger. So this made me think, like, does that mean that Raizo is going to show up next chapter looking like Itachi or something? I don't think so, right? Because, like, Shinobu just went back to the way she looked. Raizo has always had, like, the body structure of a troll. We get a time jump of several days, uh, which makes me think, like, geez, like, what, what happened to Kaido and Big Mom? It's been, it's been several days now. Still no word about what actually ended up happening to them. Now, in order for Oda to stress the point, that Yamato is joining the crew even further, he has Momonosuke search for the Straw Hats while yelling their name in the order that they joined the crew. Except that by the time he gets to Brook and Jinbei, he also adds Yamato's name at the end. By the way, we also get a small panel there with Toko and Hiyori, and Toko's still laughing it up. So I guess Chopper won't be curing the laughing illness after all. Now I think the reason for why Kinemon and Momonosuke were not included into the morning goodbyes is because their goodbye has to be special because Kinemon and Momonosuke were the first two characters that we met uh, from Wano. They were the ones that started us on this journey. We got introduced to them since Punk Hazard. So it feels very similar to like a VV situation where her goodbye, her saying goodbye to the Straw Hats can't just be like any normal goodbye. It has to be meaningful. It has to be special. And so I don't know what Oda has planned uh, for Kinemon and Momonosuke in terms of their goodbye, but I can totally tell that it's it's going to be iconic. It's going to be something like, it's probably going to be a double page spread or something next chapter. Now, here's a fun fact that I've seen people mention. So if we see the curtain for Act 3 fall, not next chapter, but the chapter after that in 1058, then that means that Wano Act 3 will be 100 chapters long because the curtain for Act 3 actually opened in chapter 958. So as long as Wano ends in chapter 1058, and it doesn't really matter where, like as long as it ends in that chapter, somewhere in that chapter, that'll make Act 3 100 chapters long, which I believe is around the same length as Dressrosa. We cut to Tokage port and we have the three supernova captains arguing about where to and when to set sail. And so in order to make sense of the directions, uh, it's important that we look at an official book that came out last year, which is called Rurubu One Piece. It's basically a, a guidebook, a travel guide, but it's official and it actually has a map of the world of One Piece. And so a user by the name of Kiwik Onigiri actually took the map from the book. He translated the names of the islands from Japanese to English and he turned the map into a 3D globe. So we do have access to that. I'm gonna leave the link to the video in the description in case you wanna check it out. And so thanks to that, we actually have the names of the three islands that are after Wano. Now the map actually shows it to us like this, so I'm gonna flip it around just so that it matches the way that it's shown in the chapter. Now, since you guys have shown that you love my drawings, because the previous one I made got over 12,000 likes on Twitter. <laughs> I'll be doing one for this as well. All right, so the island in the middle, the one that Luffy and Kid are arguing about, that's Elbaf. Now, since Kid won the draw to go to Elbaf, right? I feel like this can go one of two ways. I think Luffy can say, okay, fine, whatever. Let's go to the other island, the one that's on the right, which would be Sphinx Island, which is the hometown of Whitebeard. And it's also the island where we last saw Marco. 
before he went to Wano, right? So Nekomamushi went to pick Marco up from this island. Now, the only reason this island would be relevant to the story at all is because the last time we saw Weevil and Baking, they said that they were looking for the remnants of the Whitebeard Pirates, including Marco the Phoenix. They said they're looking for Marco to get something back, uh, Weevil's inheritance, apparently. So if they go to that island searching for Marco, the Straw Hats might run into Weevil, and it would be a good way to sort of reintroduce Weevil into the story after all this time. Now, another thing that could happen here here is for Luffy to say, screw kid, screw the draw, you know, we're going to Elbaf anyway, we're going to that middle island, uh, and I don't care what anybody says. Now the island that Law picks, which is the island on the northeast, the map actually names it Ruche, which is the French word for hive or beehive, which is another name for Hashinosu or Fulalet Island, right? So apparently Law will be sailing his submarine into Blackbeard's headquarters. Now I don't think that he will find the Blackbeard pirates there because Blackbeard said, let's set sail. We're going to make our move. So they probably won't be there. But what's interesting about Law going to Hashinosu is that not only is the island full of lore, because it's the birthplace of the Davy Back fight, uh, it has a connection to Sebek, because that's where the Rock Pirates were formed. It aligns perfectly with Law's goal about wanting to learn more about his name of, of the D, the family of D, because both Teach and Sebek have the D initial in their name, just like Law. But then also during the break, in one of the Road to Laugh Tale volumes, Oda said that the final Road Poneglyph, the Red Poneglyph that Law is looking for, might be in Hashinosu. He said that it can be in Hashinosu, Elbaf, or Vera. Now, the biggest shock of the chapter, the biggest game changer that we see here is the formation of the Cross Guild Initiative by Yonko the Clown. It turns out Buggy got so upset about losing his Chichibukai privileges that he pulled a 180 on the Marines and actually started handing out bounty posters for them. And I'm not gonna lie, that's actually a pretty genius idea. It's one of those ideas that is so simple that nobody sees coming because it's so simple that nobody thinks about it. But then when somebody executes the idea and becomes a Yonko because of it, you're like, um, why didn't I think of that? Now, unfortunately, we just get like a pamphlet to advertise the Cross Guild. It kind of looks like a Joker card. But I would have loved to have gotten a scene with the actual Cross Guild members at the table, sort of discussing their dealings, like their new targets. I can imagine Doflamingo being super jealous about Crocodile joining Buggy because <laughs> he wanted Crocodile to join him during Marine Force. So he just walks in on the meeting and tries to cut Buggy with his strings. Doflamingo. Leave me alone. Ultimately, though, I do think that Mihawk being part of the guild is what really bumps it up and actually justifies Buggy obtaining the title of Yonko. So in a way, this chapter sort of suggests that even though Buggy is the one that has the title of Yonko, when it comes to the actual muscle, right, that title should technically go to Mihawk. Yonko Mihawk. It's just that Mihawk just doesn't care about that sort of stuff. Well, and he doesn't have a crew either. But yeah, if we want to get real about this, right, the new Yonko should technically be Shanks, Luffy, Blackbeard, and Mihawk. So it's kind of like a god Usopp situation in Dressrosa, where Usopp is the one that's like the most valuable out of the guys, but the one who actually ends up taking down Dofi is Luffy. Now, for story purposes, what Buggy's move does is that it sets the stage for the final war because it's actually, it's kind of like a declaration of war against the Marines. Because by placing bounties on Marines, what you're doing is you're essentially dividing people. You're forcing them to make a choice. Like, which group do you like more? Or which group do you hate more? The Marines or the Pirates? So what you have is a level of animosity that keeps brewing all over the world between two factions. I feel like there's a very important lesson in all of this that Oda is trying to teach us, and that's that world wars, at the end of the day, are always started by clowns. Now, Law ends up giving Killer a copy of the Wano Road Poneglyph because at this point, everybody there is a friend, even though they say they're not. I like how Killer is just sort of staring at the copy there, pretending to know how to read it. That's an actual question I have. Like, even if Law and Kid get the Poneglyph copies, how are they going to interpret them? Like, they have no way of reading them, at least not, not that I know. Like, the only two living people that should be able to read that language should be Robin and Sukuyaki. Now, hypothetically speaking, let's say that Law and Kid do end up finding an interpreter, a translator for the Poneglyph language. So that means that Law and Kid both have two Road Poneglyph copies, right? Because Law was there in the Whale Tree where the Road Poneglyph was, right? So that's one. He should have the one for Zoe, and he also has the one for Wano. So that's two. And then Kid should have the one for Wano that he just got, obviously, and he should have the one that he got from Whole Cake Island. And so if I were Kid or Law, again, assuming that I was able to find a translator for the Poneglyph language, I would just trade a copy of my Whole Cake Island Poneglyph for a copy of the Zoe Poneglyph, or vice versa, you know? 
Just makes sense. Now, when it comes to Law, I do remember that it's been sort of hinted at that he can sometimes be able to tap into the voice of all things. Like, there was a moment where he could hear that, like, Luffy's voice had gone silent in Onigashima. So maybe he can use that ability to sort of, like, understand some of the poneglyphs. By the way, apparently Oda wants to keep us guessing about which commander it was that Kid fought in Whole Cake Island for the road poneglyph. So just in this one chapter, we get three character identities that are a question mark to us. The first one is we don't know which commander it was that Kid fought for the road poneglyph. The second identity that we don't know is that certain someone or the person that Caribou is talking about who he plans to inform about Poseidon and Pluton. And then the third and final identity that is sort of a silhouette. <laughs> it's not even a silhouette, but it kind of is. Uh, is the person with the fire scar or the person with the, the burnt scar, whatever you want to call him. Well, fear not, because I'm here to tell you that I have figured out who all of those three characters are. Turns out that it's not actually three different characters, but that one character fits all of those three descriptions. That's right, there's only one character in the One Piece first that fits all three of those slots. And that, my friends, is Cracker. That's right, Cracker is the sweet commander that Kid fought for the Road Poneglyph. He also has a scar on his face because he was playing with some firecrackers, and he's also Caribou's best friend. So there you have it. I solved the mystery for you so that Oda can go ahead and focus on the other 583 mysteries he has left to answer in three years. On a serious note though, I'm actually kind of glad that he brought up the caribou thing because I honestly had thought that he had forgotten about this. So ultimately I do think that caribou has to be referring to either Emu or Blackbeard. It has to be like a, an end game threat level character, you know? Somebody with enough power, somebody with enough like influence and, and muscle to be able to do something with the ancient weapons. Now there's also talk about this character with the burned scar, which Kid mentions. And there's a moment where we see both Law and Robin and they're like, hmm. So they might know something about this character, but Luffy just is completely oblivious. And it can't be Sabo because Sabo was on the news already. So if it were Sabo, I think Kid would just say, oh, it's Sabo. You know, let's go get Luffy's brother. Now him being Scopper Gabin is the most popular choice that I've seen floating around online. It makes sense because Scopper is yet to appear in the current storyline. Uh, he was featured a lot during the Odin flashback in the anime. So a character that gets that much attention, I think it's, it's just because you're thinking about bringing him back at some point. And I think it also kind of makes like poetic sense that you meet Rayleigh at the end of the first half of the Grand Line. And then to make things match, you end up meeting Scopper by the end of the second half of the Grand Line. Scopper was also right there in Laugh Tale with Roger. So it would make sense, you know, if Killer is mentioning somebody that knows about the One Piece, that it, it could be Scopper. Plus, Kid says that there's not enough information. They don't have enough leads on, on this character, right? Which would also fit Scopper because we essentially know nothing about him post Roger's execution. So Scopper is a possibility. But, you know, knowing Oda, it could even be like a brand new character that he just decided to create for this purpose. I want to talk about the burn scar as sort of like the defining trait of this character. But in order for me to talk about that, I kind of have to mention something that we learn about in film Red. So I haven't seen the movie, but spoilers are already out floating around online. So I have to mention some of those spoilers, you know, in order to make a point. So spoiler warning. I will be talking about some film red spoilers. So basically during the film, it's revealed that Shanks can essentially ignite his sword on fire. Like he can just make it burst into flame, sort of like what King did against Zoro. And so the thing about that is that that's sort of like a Lunarian trait, you know, being able to burst into fire, uh, ignite things like King did. Also, apparently in the movie, Roger finds little Shanks in a treasure chest after the, the Battle of God's Valley. So Roger and his crew are leaving God's Valley, and I guess they, they took this treasure chest, and inside was young Shanks. So I want to read this really quickly. It's from chapter 958. This is Sengoku speaking. He says, In short, this is the truth. In order to protect celestial dragons and their slaves at God's Valley, Garp joined forces with Roger there at that island, and they broke apart the rock's pirates. That is the God Valley incident. So because the God's Valley incident was all about protecting celestial dragons 
and Shanks was found inside of a treasure chest hiding, or at least appeared to be hiding, or maybe just like Corazon in Law, somebody put him there for his own protection, then if you connect the dots, then the movie heavily implies that Shanks is actually, or was actually, a celestial dragon. And we had actually gotten another hint about this during the break, because during the break, there was sort of like a, a brief announcement from Oda saying or, or asking like the fans to please check out these Uta video journals that were gonna be posted up on the official One Piece YouTube channel. And in one of those journals, she's actually looking at these bounty posters. And one of the bounties is Doflamingo's poster. And so she looks at Doflamingo and she says, oh, I actually have some similar sunglasses lying around for some reason. And so we obviously know that Doflamingo used to be a celestial dragon. And so it's like, why does Shanks's daughter, quote unquote, have those glasses there to begin with? So that was another hint, right, to Shanks being uh, connected to the celestial dragons, in addition to being able to just walk up to Marijoa and have an audience with the Gorosei, right? Now, in terms of actual feats in the movie, or at least the feats that mattered to me from the movie Film Red, turns out that Shanks can cancel out, can actually negate other people's observation hockey, much like he did with Green Bull in the manga at one point during the film. Using his Conqueror's hockey, Shanks actually does get Fujitora and Kizaru to withdraw. Also, somebody who saw the movie stated that apparently Yasop's observation hockey is better than Katakuri's observation hockey, which um, I haven't seen the movie, but if, if I had to guess, I would say that it's not that Yasop's observation hockey is better than Katakuri's. I think it's just different because Katakuri kind of specializes in being able to see the future. Whereas like if, if we look at Usopp, right, as, as an example for his dad or whatever, right? Usopp's observation hockey is more about being able to see through things. So I don't think it's it's necessarily that Yasop's observation hockey uh, is better than Katakuri's. I just think that it's different. They're both like sort of like different branches of observation hockey, right? Katakuri is about perceiving the future and Yasop's and Usopp's observation hockey is about being able to sort of see through things and uh, you know, kind of like x-ray vision sort of specialty. Apparently Ben Beckman can actually catch bullets with his hands. Just imagine Ben going like Turns out Lucky Roo is the cook of the crew, which would put him in the same sort of slot as Sanji. Because in my mind, the order has always gone Shanks, Ben, and then Lucky Roo. So if you equate that to Luffy's crew, it's Luffy, Zoro, and Sanji. Also the way that Lucky Roo fights is sort of like Choji, rolls himself into a ball, spins forward and just kind of like charges on. That's what I learned about Film Red. I'm kind of worried though that there's so much stuff about like Shanks's crew in the movie that like this is Oda's way of saying that I'm putting this in this film because in the manga I'm not gonna have time for it. We don't have time for Shanks's crew in the manga but we do have time for the nine red scabbards. How about that? Anyhow, going back to the whole topic about the man with the burned scar, I feel that because in the movie it's revealed that Shanks can actually light his sword on fire, that man could be somebody that Shanks wounded with his sword, with his fire technique. So maybe that's why Kid knows about this character, because he fought Shanks, lost an arm, and maybe he heard about another one of Shanks' victims. So that would just kind of fit the whole Film Red promotion campaign that appears to be going on. People are also saying that it could be Aokiji, but the thing about that is that Aokiji has more than one burned scar because of his fight with Akainu. So yeah, I think it's more likely that it's actually somebody that Shanks wounded with his fire sword. That's gonna do it for me today, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for all of your support uh, throughout my videos and throughout the years, you know, cause sometimes I, I do get messages from, from some of you guys telling me like, uh, Sawyer, so like I, I've been watching you ever since your Naruto days. So, but really, honestly, just thank you to everybody. Uh, even if you disagree with me, I really appreciate uh, the fact that you tune in on Sundays or whenever you tune in to watch uh, what I have to say. Thank you so much. Take care. We'll catch you guys later. Bye.